Hello everyone, my name is Jacqueline Schneider and I'm the Community Science Outreach <laughs> Coordinator for the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History. And welcome to Digital Science Saturday, Day of the Dinosaur. Today's Science Saturday is a special one because we are actually hybrid. So we have a lot of things happening online like this amazing dino tutorial. Um, but we also have a quiz that will be posted in our Instagram story. Um, we also have activities that can be printed out from our website, including a dinosaur maze, coloring pages, and even a movement cube. So feel free to check out our website for all of those cool resources. And after this tutorial, feel free to come on down to the museum where we have some physically distanced activities that are safe and fun for everyone. So let me introduce uh, Charles Nye, also known as the Paint Paddock, um, who is a paleo artist um, who in his free time actually draws organisms from prehistoric times and does all this really cool stuff. You might remember him from our T-Rex drawing tutorial from last year. And so we're super excited to learn um, to draw Triceratops this year. And I'll let you take it away, Charles. All right. Good morning, everyone in Pacific time, everyone else. Good day or evening, wherever you are in this beautiful world. Uh, yeah, today we're going to be drawing uh, one of well, my favorite dinosaurs ever of all time. <laughs> Certainly the uh, a classic for the public too, Triceratops. Uh, this species, Triceratops horitus, was one of the last horned dinosaurs, the Ceratopsians, to ever exist, to our knowledge. Uh, and it's, you know, just a classic. So we're going to go uh, hit the ground running. Um, but first, let, let's uh, talk about why I kind of made a bunch of circles and strange looking <laughs> bits and pieces. One of the uh, easiest ways to draw something a bit more uh, complex in terms of pose or things like that for an artist is to break things down into their constituent shapes. So uh, if you were around for last year for the T-Rex, we did a very similar uh, thing. And how you do this, you look at any everyday object or subject, for example, my, my mug here, this is a cylinder, obviously so, and this is a kind of a hose-like thing on the side. With enough time and practice and a lot of you know sketching and studying, you can start to break apart things in your everyday life into different shapes, including live, or in this case, dead <laughs> animals like Triceratops. Um, and so this just makes things a whole lot easier um, when you start to draw down the road. One good uh, bit of information for anybody who's drawing with a pen, pen or pencil and paper, however you will on a physical piece of paper, draw these lightly because uh, we'll be going over and erasing them. Because I'm on a digital screen, I'm drawing on, on an iPad, I get to do some fancy digital art tricks and stuff that you might not be able to do on a piece of paper unless you're a wizard. So let's uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, take your time. Uh, we're gonna get started on the head. So focus in on getting uh, these shapes copied down, that circle and this kind of strange looking uh, half oval and a bunch of other things. Um, so let's get going. And also if you need me to slow down, don't be afraid to shout out in the chat. So uh, Triceratops is called such because um, of its, well, <laughs> its face. Tri meaning three, uh, Sarah horned, and I think tops means face. So it's triceratops, three horned face, um, because it has, of course, three horns on the face, two large uh, brow horns, and one smaller nasal horn. And the function of these horns is still debated in scientific circles. Um, some hypothesize that it was for combat, for fighting against things like T Rex and other triceratops. Others, uh, may conclude that it was for mating rituals, for display purposes, to look tough and mean. Some hypothesize it was used to kick up plants and push them aside, knock them down. But honestly, it was probably a combination of factors that led to the evolution of these large horns on the head. And uh, I forget the exact length, but just uh, for demonstration purposes, a Triceratops's hip height was anywhere from seven to eight or nine feet. 
So the horns themselves are pretty long too. <laughs> and um, unlike the horns of things like a rhinoceros today, Triceratops horns had a bony core. So there was actual bone underlying and reinforcing the horns and growing on top of them was a, uh, a layer of keratin. And you also have keratin all over your body. Keratin is the same material that makes up our fingernails and our hair. Um, and it's what makes up the entirety of a rhinoceros's horn. So for a triceratops, you have this underlying bit of keratin, this underlying core, and on top of that grow, uh, underlying core of bone, I mean, on top of that grows the keratin. And the shape and the size of the keratin that grows out of it is also still hotly debated in uh, scientific circles. Um, so I like to give my triceratopses pretty, pretty long horns because uh, when you think about it, if they were used for all the reasons I said earlier, they probably benefit to be constantly growing that keratin sheath and out, like your fingernails grow out or your dog's or cat's nails grow out. And next cool attribute of Triceratops is the beak that we're gonna be giving some attention right here. Uh, so this dinosaur ate some pretty tough plants back in its day, uh, kind of low growing shrubs, twigs, uh, you know, kind of woody plants, uh, cropping them up with that massive beak of itself, uh, massive beak on the end of its face and grinding it up with hundreds of teeth hundreds of small teeth at the back of its mouth. So I'm giving it a nostril here. Again, taking my time. Trying my best to not use the undo features on my uh, digital drawing space because you guys don't have an undo feature. You have to erase it if you make something you don't quite agree with doing. All right, we're gonna go ahead and do the other side of the beak right here underneath. So that's how far we've gotten so far. And I'll just finish off this last bit of the, the jaw. All right. All right, people in chat, how are we doing? Let me see your faces. Oh, well, I see some faces. So good, awesome, cool. Let's keep moving then. All right, now let's go to an interesting part of the dinosaur, uh, the eye. So obviously, uh, I guess it's not too obvious, but eyes don't really fossilize. <laughs> um, so it's kind of hard to tell what the eye of a triceratops would look like. Um, what's very interesting about modern animals' eyes is that the shape of the pupil is dictated primarily through ecology, not by evolutionary relationships. So you could have species of animals that are closely related but have different pupil shapes. The reason why is this, this pupil shape lets in light in different ways. So in most, uh, well, a good majority of terrestrial animals, you'll see the eyes are kind of just a, a circle. So the pupils are kind of like a circular shape. This lets, you know, a pretty, it's a pretty uh, standard like jack of all trades eye. Let's a good amount of light in, can contract really easily when there's too much light, that kind of stuff. For uh, things like uh, animals that are preyed upon, think like the goats, think even things like cephalopods, octopuses and squids and stuff. Their eyes are shaped kind of horizontally like this. This allows them to have the most peripheral vision possible um, so that when they're eating or whatever, they can keep, an, <laughs> keep both eyes really out for anything that might come and attack them. In this case, you know, something like a Tyrannosaurus would be something you want to watch out for as a Triceratops, right? So what's uh, cool is that you can give your Triceratops a horizontal eye and have that be a relatively you know, decent conclusion to come to, uh, backed by ecological science because these things were indeed prey for you know, the large predators of their heyday. So I like to give my uh, four-legged terrestrial dinosaurs, uh, or terrestrial uh, herbivorous dinosaurs, a kind of goat eye, give them a chance to try to spot <laughs> oncoming danger before it's too late. And uh, let's go to a cool bit of the Triceratops, the uh, shield 
the back of the head, there's this frill that extends outward. It's shaped kind of like a Pringle. <laughs> a very, very, very big Pringle that's, of course, thicker and made of bone. Um, but again, if you want to learn to uh, draw more complex things like this, there's a lot of everyday items you could use for reference. In this case, honest to God, a Pringle works really well. So we're going to go ahead and make this happen. And so as Triceratops grows, um, there's a cool thing that happens with its frill. When it's an uh, immature animal, it has these spikes on the sides of the frill like that, and they run all the way down and around. But as the animal matures, as it gets older, these spikes get smaller and more dull in shape. They get resorbed back into the frill. So if we want this to be a mature, you know, adult, uh, give it some like kind of, you know, very gentle little hornlets poking out of here. But if you want your triceratops to be a little younger, a little more <laughs> rambunctious and, uh, you know, teenage in that age, give it some spikier bits on the, the frill. So I'm gonna make mine an adult. And we're gonna come over here and we're gonna do uh, one last thing on the face before I move on to the rest of the body is uh, kind of flush with the eye and extending out this way. If you feel your own cheeks, you feel this kind of ridge right here, like this bony thing pointing out right beneath your eye this way. Uh, Triceratops had a horn or like an extension of the bone kind of coming out like that. And like this. What that was used for, we still don't know. Some uh, paleontologists think it was covered in a spiky horn. We, we don't quite know yet what this is for, but a lot of ceratopsians, triceratops included, had this thing jutting out. So make sure to give it that. And um, here, I'm going to give it some jaw muscles down here. And one question that a lot of people come up with when they're drawing a dinosaur that people, you know, I don't think is a very common thing of knowledge is where does the ear go on a dinosaur? Uh, and most paleontologists and most paleo artists reconstruct the ear as being kind of behind the space where the top and the bottom jaws meet. And so if we were to envision this triceratops' top and bottom parts of the skull meeting somewhere around here, the ear would be behind all that in a space right behind the skull. Um, it could be higher, it could be lower, but behind that area is typically where uh, we'd expect that to be based on where the ear is in modern reptiles today, birds included. All right, so I'm gonna stop here for a second, let you all catch up. This is what the face of our Triceratops looks like so far. Um, very handsome looking uh, guy or gal right here. Um, yes, so let me check on chat. Are we all uh, ready to keep going with the body? Yes. How are you doing? How are you doing, Elik? Good. Thumbs up. Awesome. All right. Let's keep going with the rest of the body. It's so funny when we're zoomed in so closely, and then you zoom out. And you're like, oh, look at all this that we've already done. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really neat. Huh? I was like, oh, wait, we're already there. <laughs> so. Another trick if you're drawing on paper is you could move your paper around. Uh, no one's perfect at putting their hands in different positions to make different lines happen. Um, so for me on an iPad, I could just turn it. But if you have a paper, you could also turn it as well. It makes things easier for me to draw, especially when it comes to more lines like this, like the, the neck of a triceratops right here. So I'll move down and we'll start paying attention to the neck. I like to give my dinosaurs, uh, or especially Triceratops, a very thick muscular neck. Think about it. It's it's carrying this um, this huge head 24-7. <laughs> it's got to have some major musculature here to support that. So a very, you know, rotund uh, set of muscles right there and soft tissue to keep that neck supported or keep that head supported. And down here, we're going to go ahead and uh, this is kind of the chest of the animal. It's, it's on all fours, right? So this is the chest and the shoulder area that we're going to draw next. 
coming in like that. This is a bit of soft tissue coming down like this. And then the other part of the chest right over here. Very nice, cool. All right, let's move on to the legs, or well, the first set of legs. So uh, Triceratops and other horned dinosaurs were primarily uh, quadrupedal, four-legged, but they did evolve from bipedal uh, ancestors. So their ancestors, the most early Ceratopsians, walked on two legs. But as they got heavier, as they got more muscular, as they got more, uh, as the predators got nastier, <laughs> they went on all fours over evolutionary time. A bit easier to defend yourself that way if you want to stand and fight. So this is kind of that that big ball right there is the, the kind of the shoulder uh, part. So like you know this part of your muscles and your bone e equivalent. Move down here. This is a space where the tricep would be, and then the bicep right next to it. You might ask, like, how do I know all these muscles? Honestly, I don't know a whole lot of muscles. <laughs> but um, a really cool thing about most terrestrial vertebrate animals is we share a lot of the same muscle groups. And if you uh, look into more related groups of animals, like reptiles or mammals or whatever, all mammals, all reptiles together, you'll start seeing similarities between where the, the muscle groups go and, and what is exaggerated, what is not. So a lot of what we try to do in paleo art is infer based on what is known from modern animals that are related to the things we want to draw or restore. So if I was drawing a mammoth, I'd want to look at an elephant. If I was doing a giant ground sloth, I'd look at sloths, right? If I'm doing a triceratops, I'd look at birds and crocodilians. Birds being the last lineage of dinosaurs alive today. Dinosaurs never went extinct. It's just that some of the meat-eating dinosaurs got feathers and wings and we're able to flutter away from all the bad stuff going on after the meteor. Um, and crocodilians are the last living relatives of, of dinosaurs, including birds. So looking at those groups of animals, we could draw some pretty cool inferences about muscle shape, distribution, behavior, things like that. All right, cool note about Triceratops too, and all other dinosaurs have this as well. Look at your hand. You have five fingers, right? And every single one of them has a nail on it. For dinosaurs, uh, some of them, you know, eventually lost some of their fingers, you know, look at T-Rex. <laughs> but all dinosaurs have, if they were to have any claws at all, any nails, would only have them on the first, second, and third digits. Four and five, if they had them, did not have any claws on them. So on your Triceratops, this is digit five, this is digit four, this is digit three, two, one, going around this way. So let me go ahead and illustrate what that looks like. Kind of a, a flattened nail. Another cool thing, as we talked about, I think last time too, is that dinosaurs do not walk um, palms down or even with their palms facing the ground in a certain perfectly right they, they couldn't do the bunny pose you see that the jurassic park raptors can do right they couldn't do that for some reason they just never evolved that articulation what they did instead is that they they walked if they were to walk on their front hands like this on the tips of their fingers and the palms facing each other in a weird kind of this sort of motion as opposed to like this so the palms would always face each other, which makes for an interesting and a little difficult to draw <laughs> uh, thing to do. So that's the third digit. This is the second digit. And digit one might not be able to be visible at this angle, and you'll see why in a second. So uh, let's go ahead and kind of give it more of the belly right here. Cool. 
So let's give it the other hand. Let me show you what I mean by like, you can't, might not be able to see digit one from that angle. So let's do the opposite arm. I also like to give my triceratops some pretty pronounced like wrinkles and folds, um, kind of like a rhino, kind of like monitor lizards today. Large reptiles tend to have, you know, lots of folds, large animals period, especially on land. So digit five on a triceratops, as you see here, the pinky, you might call it, uh, for the most part was either not on the ground or barely touching. We don't know why. <laughs> this is based on uh, track data, based on footprint information. So here's that palm, right? So the, the, the palm and the inside of the hands would be facing each other as opposed to on the ground. Digit one on a triceratops and all other ceratopsians was kind of splayed inward in a very interesting way. Kind of like your, like basically like how your thumb is splayed out like this. So that's digit one. This is digit two, and then three, four, would be back here where you can't see it. And this is digit five right here. I hope that makes some sense. It's uh, something that requires a lot of uh, time <laughs> into understanding and learning, but uh, you'll be rewarded with some really cool anatomical details if you take the time to, to learn it. But no stress if it's uh, a little difficult to do took me a whole lot of time to get to this point <laughs> as well. So let's uh, go ahead and take a look at our Triceratops now. I like how they look. I do think I can make the muscles a little bigger just from an intuitive sense. So you, you uh, as the artist have some artistic liberties as well as, you know, humans have a degree of common sense, right? When something doesn't look quite right in terms of, you know, well, that should be maybe a little more muscular, maybe not so much this way, that way. Trust your gut. Because humans are very observant creatures. And so we can make some unconscious inferences that just make something just feel more real. So I'm gonna go ahead, and just kind of slightly beef up our triceratops's uh, arm muscles just to make them look a little more, you know, able to carry that weight on them. Cool. And feel free to put your picture up to your camera. You can take a see how. Yes, that'd be very cool to see. Mine's a little long. Has bird legs. <laughs> All right, let's take a second to see how it looks, people. Let me let me see your triceratopses. Very, very good, people. Nice, good stuff. All right, without further ado, let's continue with the rest of the body. So we have all the the, the front hands done and the arms. Let's move on to the back side. I'm going to turn my canvas, turn your paper if you wish, and I'm going to go ahead and kind of finish off that back section. I'm not being too clean about this right now. I'm just going to do kind of sketchy lines. I'll go through and clean it up later. Um, if I were drawing on paper and pencil, I'd also not be too clean about, you know, certain parts that I'll go in and detail and with an eraser, you know, go through and clean up those lines. One of the benefits of being able to do direct input on an iPad is it feels more real. <laughs> All right. Very cool stuff. Let's move on to that back leg now. So just like the front legs, Triceratops' back leg muscles were very, very, very large <laughs> to support this thing. Uh, we don't know how fast Triceratops could move. Uh, that's just not something that people have 
put too much research into. Not yet, at least. But we do know the T-Rex, well, no, as in we can infer from uh, digital computer modeling and things like that, that T-Rex could fast walk. T-Rex couldn't run. T-Rex could fast walk at a speed of about 12 miles an hour. And while that doesn't sound very fast because we have cars, um, 12 miles an hour on a treadmill is beyond my sprinting speed, definitely. <laughs> um, so with that in mind, if T-Rex can run 12 miles an hour, that means it's probably as fast, if not faster than its prey. So Triceratops was probably within the same range of uh, ability to move, if not slower. Not that it has to run anywhere, it has that big shield head, right? And we gave it those goat eyes so it could see trouble when it comes, right? So I'm giving it, you know, just kind of some skin folds, some attachment points for soft connective tissue against the body. There's that thick leg coming down like this. Uh, the musculature for Triceratops and other dinosaurs, again, is based a lot on modern reptiles. And we infer that from how they look, as well as where there's there's scar attachment points on your your bones and other animals' bones, where muscles and ligaments attach onto. So if we look at a full triceratops, we could see where the muscles attached. What is sometimes not known is the volume, how big the muscles might have been. Give me a bit of a some knee wrinkles here, and then some muscle definition above or overlaying that femur. All right. As I said earlier, dinosaurs walked on their toes. Triceratops was no exception. So how the toes looked. Uh, if you look at a lot of illustrations of Triceratops, you'll see that people usually give them elephants-ish looking feet. Uh, not really. Uh, what we think nowadays, based on what the skeletons look like, is more of a, a very fat bird foot. Very, very just sausages. I'm talking just a meaty bird foot. Think more of that than elephant. A lot of weight to put on their toes. There was some padding on the bottom. Elephants walk on their toes, but they're, they're, you know, the length of the toe wasn't as long, isn't as long as a triceratops or other dinosaurs. But a lot of animals walk on their toes. Um, I think it's a biomechanically more efficient way to distribute weight and stuff. Unless you're a whale, in which case you don't care. <laughs> All right, so um, how this looks is a, again, like a stocky kind of bird foot. It's kind of facing us. So you'll see that it's kind of foreshortened. You know, if I face my pinky towards you, it looks a little shorter, but it's just because it's in front view as opposed to full side view. So that's first foot. And you'll see I'm doing a little like kind of half circles to help me wiggle my way down to like imagine how long this might be in this view. These were kind of flatter looking. And if we get to, this is, you know, that fourth toe, that third toe, second toe, you can maybe see it might get a little longer over here like that. And this is what I mean by like a fatter bird toe. It's not like, you know, like an elephant that's like this, right? Like that's kind of an approximation of an elephant foot really quickly. <laughs> not like that, more like a bird. Let's do that back leg now. You'll see that I've uh, made kind of this backside armature out of the, you know, like that just to estimate in my head where the part we don't see would be. So the, the knee is up there. It's kind of about to lift up in my head and maybe move forward a little bit. So it's a bit more hunched over, ready to spring. I'm giving it some, again, some wrinkles, some little bits and flavor pieces. So they're about to get going. Let's draw that. Triceratops had four toes in the back, uh, much like on the uh, on the hands, that, that kind of first toe all the way in was a little smaller 
and a little raised up, not quite off the ground, but it's definitely smaller. So you wouldn't see it perfectly from the side. But uh, if you look inward like this, you'll see a, a bit of a smaller toe on the inside of the foot. I'm gonna do that kind of half circle trick, teach myself or to estimate where I'm gonna be. I don't like how that looks, so I'll go ahead and erase it. There we go. Let's do some fix ups, some adjustments, and take your time. See chat. Perhaps, yes, I would be definitely interested in seeing what you got, Zoom user. Wish there was a name I could refer to you by. There we go. This looks like it. And then toe four would be, you know, behind that toe. So we wouldn't be able to see it in this angle. Cool. I'm going to zoom out. I'm going to turn off my shape layer to see where we are right now. So my trike looks like at the time. Uh, let me see what your triceratops is. Triceratops eye. Triceratops. Here it is. All right, Patrick. Let's see yours. Very, very nice. Oh, wow. Very good. Chris. Very nice. And uh, I can't scroll down as easily. Carla, good job. You look you too. Good stuff, people. Okay. Well, uh, thumbs up. We're ready to keep going. Cool. Let me get a quick jolt of caffeine. Let's keep going. All right. The last bit of the kind of thicker lines we're going to do tonight today um, is the tail. So the, tricer the tail of a triceratops was surprisingly not long. Uh, this might be because it lost some evolutionary importance over time, if you look at some other dinosaurs, like the big long neck sauropods, those guys kind of needed that tail for counterbalance, for defense, for whatever. But a triceratops is very grounded <laughs> with just its four legs and that big head, right? It's very compact of an animal. So that tail probably became more of a liability if it were to be too long. So over ev evolutionary time, it might've gotten just shorter. But that said, it was still a very important part of the animal's biology. The tail is where a lot of the leg muscles would attach to, to help propel it. Some people smarter than me have shown this in computer simulations. So show that the tail kind of, you know, some wrinkles down here to illustrate that, you know, there might be some muscle linkage there. That's where the skin would fold as it moves back and forth. So that's it for the overall uh, lines on the exterior. As I said earlier, I'm going to go in with like a bit of an eraser and kind of clean up some of the lines I did earlier, just because we want it to look pretty, right? Just you know, clean her up a little bit. Hi, you like. I'm watching chat too over here. Let me turn this. Clean up that back lines. And once I'm satisfied, I'm not going to worry too much about it because, you know, we're going to. We can't be here all day. As much as I would love to be here all day, can't be here all day. For me, sometimes it could take up to like six, seven, eight hours to fully finish something to where I want it to be. Um, if it's a new dinosaur I haven't done before, yeah, <laughs> it takes a lot longer. <laughs> okay, I cleaned up a bit. Um, let's see, what else do I want to do? About uh, how many dinosaurs have you completed drawings for? Oh, uh, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> but um, I don't know the exact number of species or the exact number of illustrations, but you know, it, it's un not unfortunate. I keep having to go back to like the classic dinosaurs because it's like, oh, I learned so much about how to make art. I want to go back and redo that T-Rex from last year or something. So it's a cycle. 
Um, I don't know. You Dozens. keep upgrading, upgrading your dinosaurs. Upgrading the old ones. Like, yeah, I like, you know, with, with new scientific findings or maybe like a different color pattern I want to do. And it's like, oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> keep cycling through the same like 10 or 12, but that's okay. Um, I definitely encourage everyone to check out the paint uh, pad up on Instagram and your blog page. I'll make sure to get the links in the chat so that everybody can check out because you have a ton of art up there and they're all really cool. And narrowing it down to triceratops was was difficult. <laughs> oh yes, it was. But it's it's a good dinosaur to do because you know, there's so much reference about it. Um, makes it easier to kind of put together. That's that's a good thing about you know things like the more popular dinosaurs are popular for a reason. It's usually because you know they're either the biggest or more like you know extreme evolutionary iterations of that group, or there's just so much more known about them in terms of fossil evidence, so we have a better picture of what they looked like. Okay, and now I guess um, we're gonna go in and start detailing this dino a little bit more. I'll show you what kind of scales. Uh, triceratops might have had. So this is what our body looks like right now. I'm happy with it. <laughs> I'm very happy with how it looks so far. Kind of a, a sketchy, you know, pencily kind of look. That's what we're going for. I miss drawing a pencil. I'm honest with you. <laughs> Can never beat pencil and paper sometimes. So we're going to start with the head, uh, like what we did earlier. With like these jagged bits of it, you know. So we're gonna go ahead and give it that kind of a, a circular, you know, because in cross session the horns are, you know, basically just a bunch of circles, right? So we'll give it kind of uh, these rounded textural bits just to infer the shape as it goes up like this. Something like that, very lightly. Not too hard. There's a bit of randomness to this bit. So don't worry about making it, you know, one to one with me. Just do what feels right. Because nature isn't perfect, especially when it comes to growing keratin, that's for sure. So the, the horn also has keratin, the, the nasal horn, I mean, and then the beak also would have kind of keratin things. The way keratin grows, usually it's kind of in like, repeating shapes so it would like conform to the shape of where it originates from so in this case the very edge of his beak so that's kind of how i used to infer what the texturing looks like as well as imperfections from like being used so i'll give it like little scratches and scrapes because this this part of the mouth especially right the beak is used for cropping big bits of branches right so it's gonna be chipped it's gonna be worn it's gonna be not factory perfect, and that's okay. It's good stuff. Get that bit like that. So that's kind of the texturing I do on, on those bits. And what covers the head of a triceratops is a, like a lot of things in paleontological science is very hotly debated. There's some paleontologists and researchers who think that the entire head was covered, or at least the top part of the head was covered in keratin as well. Others are a bit more apprehensive <laughs> about that. It'd be a big shield head, which is while cool, um, we don't have direct any uh, we don't have any direct evidence for that. There's no impressions um, left on the you know on the sediment of what that looks like. We'll get to that later. There are some impressions of Triceratops skin that we have, and those are really cool. But for the head, not quite sure. One kind of popular way to do it that I kind of I'm inclined to more agree with is that uh, a kind of hexagonal uh, crocodilian scale-ish looking head. Crocodilians on their head don't really even have scales. It's just skin that's been covered in thick growths and cracked in a way that's hexagonal. So this, again, this part will be a little bit, it won't be perfect. We don't need it to be perfect because again, nature is random. I do kind of gentle or like really quick hexagons like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Just covering that frill. 
in different kind of shapes and not different shapes, but different sizes and things like that. You could stretch the hexagons. You can do all that. Um, for some reason in nature, hexagons are just like the go-to shape for things like scales or like cracked skin and stuff. I actually learned uh, hexagons are one of the most energy efficient. So it's like the most surf, um, circumference area for the size. Ooh. So that's why like honeybees have uh, hexagonal like hives when they're making it mm -hmm. the most energy efficient shape that'll that'll totally that checks out <laughs> so it, it independently evolved in so many different organisms and animals throughout throughout nature so learn how to draw hexagons folks if you want to <laughs> do more nature reconstructions because i didn't know that it's really cool stuff so again, I'm just kind of lightly doing this. Um, a good artist trick is that the further away from where you want people to be paying attention to, you don't have to detail as hard. That's just, you know, something that artists do. Uh, allocate your time smartly. You don't have to scrutinize over every scale, right? You don't have to scrutinize over the scales definitely all the way in the back. <laughs> and I'll kind of carry this pattern eh, just about all the way around the face. Um, I gave it some embellishments here on the eyes and stuff like that, kind of, some kind of thicker looking brow looking horn or horns, little, yeah, things like that. Give it some spice, you know. And over here, I kind of gave it, you know, as well, some thicker kind of keratinized scales on that ridge of the nose coming down. And, you know, just kind of gently infer the shape of hexagons. So that's one form of scale that's possible on Triceratops. Another form that I'll show you two on the side here are uh, kind of these hexagonal reticuli that we see this on a whole lot of uh, modern dinosaurs today and extinct dinosaurs in the past where there's like a little bit of space between the, the scales, right? But they're all kind of hexagonal, little circular rounded hexag hexagons. That's one form called reticuli. Reticule. Another form, and this is known from Ceratopsian skin impressions. So Ceratopsian would sometimes, you know, hit a muddy bank or they'll die on a, a muddy bank. And then as their body decomposes, there's still the impression of what their skin looked like against that mud. And it's so cool. And this is, again, known direct fossil evidence, non-overlapping hexagonal kind of a mosaic like this. So similar to what we did on the head, but a bunch of little hexagons like this. And in between them are these bigger kind of feature scales. We call it one, two, three, four, five, six. These bigger feature scales are in between them. And these are kind of raised bump structures. So it's just kind of how it looks like coarsely. So this is just a scale mosaic, we'll call it. And then the Another impression, I don't think this is uh, quite published yet, but on the underside of a ceratopsian, they had the kind of crocodilian, you know, looking, if you ever have a, like a crocodile leather bag, uh, this kind of, this is, the, this is the view from the belly looking up, um, kind of long form bands of scales like this, right? something like that, belly scales. So many options to use on your Ceratopsian. Um, I like to use a mix and match up of all three. The belly scale is pretty exclusively on the underside. Um, the scale mosaic, I like to do kind of on the, primarily the back and more of the body of the Ceratopsian. Reticula, I like putting on like the feet or the face or stuff like that. So you'll see I'm putting reticula all over the face a bit right here. Bit of lint on my iPad. So yeah, I'll kind of just quickly go in. Um, they don't have to be perfect hexagons, especially at this scale, right? You can make them just little tiny circles, but just know that if you were to like fully detail this out, you'd want to adhere a little bit more to that hexagonal shape. But again, know where to spend your time as an artist. And of course, another option for really any dinosaur or any animal, I mean, any reptile like this, is just bare skin is also an option on some parts of the body. 
Um, for me, I like to put that in like the nose area. That this entire part of a triceratops is is basically a big hollow chamber um, with the nose out of it. So were they good at smelling? Was it used for a like a resonating chamber to like make sound? Was it used to like puff up and like there's some birds today, like frigate birds will puff up air through parts of their body and just make these brilliant balloons of display. Also possible. You won't be sure until someone makes a time machine. And so we'll, I'll go in and just, you know, put a bit of the belly scales where I think they might go, like on the underside of the neck. That's one good part. Got it right here, going down like this. It's a good detail to know, but you know, usually when it comes to shading and things like that, the belly is a little obscured in shadow. So sometimes it's hard to see it, but you know it's there. And again, along the underside of the tail, would be a good place to put these two. Cool. Let's move on to the rest of the body. So the scale mosaic. If I'm honest, it will take us a long time to do if we're going to be here and draw every single scale on a Triceratops. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to draw kind of those big feature scales and a little bit of the mosaic around it to kind of, you know, infer where that might be. You know, you want to, again, smartly allocate your time as an artist. So let's draw some of those uh, feature scales. Um, up top, here's what they would look like. So Top down, these feature scales, you know, like pretty big hexagonal shapes, a little rounded with a big node at the middle of it. From a side view, they look a little bit like Hershey's Kisses, if I'm honest with you. So kind of like that sort of shape. Sort of like that, a little, little spiky, uh, not, not too much, but a little spiky. So I like to go through and quickly make some hexagons on the back side of the animal. One to be four, five, six, one to be four, five, six. Don't be worried if it takes you a little longer to make your hexagons. There's a reason why it's fast for me. It's because I draw a lot of hexagons <laughs> on a fairly regular basis. And so uh, as it, as it kind of goes up the body, let's think about perspective now. So these feature scales be closer to facing us, right? Like facing directly at us. So we'd see the top side, but as it goes up the side, think of it like this, it goes up like this. You'll see more of the top becoming more pronounced. So as we get closer to the top of the animal, you'll see more of the tops of the feature scales, like so. And then go, you can go in and do some very thin kind of jagged lines between to infer that there's more there, right? Inference, tricking the eye into thinking that there's more is very important, All right? And we'll keep going you know, along the backside, kind of a spiky angle like this. And along the tail, one thing I like to embellish on is the tail being the tapering bit. I like to give them some spikes towards the end. Um, that's purely artistic license. There's no evidence for it, but reptiles are known to have some pretty intricate looking scales and spikes and things. Very uh, variable degrees of ornamentation. And then more feature scales on that leg, on that flank. The function of these feature scales isn't known. It might have been to deter predators. You know, it gives T-Rex a lot harder of a time to get a good bite. If there's a bunch of jagged, pointy things in your mouth. Um, we don't know. We're not quite sure yet. And we also don't know exactly where the placement was. Um, that's not published yet, where these feature scales would be on the animal. So until then, I can just kind of, you hypothesize. You think about where would be the most likely place. For me, it makes sense to be on the back. The back kind of on the sides-ish, right?
And they keep talking about how Tyrannosaurus would be a problem for Triceratops. Let's be honest here. <laughs> no Tyrannosaurus is going to bring down something like this <laughs> at, when it's fully healthy. So like in modern animals today, if a Tyrannosaur or another big predator is going to go after a Ceratopsian, it's going to go after the young, the sick, the weak, the old. But against a mature, hot-blooded, ready-to-go, prime of its life Triceratops, there's no question. Unless the Tyrannosaur was very desperate. So do you think, in your opinion, that uh, an adult Triceratops had any, like, interesting predators? I mean... Uh, they made it to adulthood, they were... If they made it to adulthood, probably nothing would really bother them when you think about it, right? They're, just, they're so big. <laughs> they're, so, <laughs> they're, they're huge. I mentioned, like, seven to, like, nine-ish feet at the hip. That's at the hip. Right over here. <laughs> the average person stands somewhere around here. Big, big animal. The size of a, a pickup truck and a trailer on the back of it. Um, so I don't think anything would mess with a Triceratops at full size and like, again, prime of its life. As it gets older, as it gets a little weaker, a little slower, maybe. Give it a bit more nodules here and there. And then I'll give it some wrinkles on the, the side right here. There is a, a foot of a dinosaur called a hadrosaur, one of the duckbill dinosaurs. There's a mummified foot of one. Very cool. Um, well, it's, not, it's, it's, of course, fossilized, but the skin was also preserved with it as well. We call it a mummy. But um, it shows that on parts of the body, or indicates on parts of the body with high flexion, high degrees of articulation and movement and motion, the scales there would be very small as opposed to other parts that maybe were a little bit more stagnant. So um, interesting point if you want to, if you do want to draw this thing uh, scale to scale all the way through, places like the elbow, places like the, the kind of pit of your bicep and your forearm right here, um, ankle joints, jointed areas would be but maybe have smaller scales, allow that part of the body to move without being too rigid. And so if I were to be uh, drawing this, you know, as a personal thing to my library or a commission, I'd keep going, perhaps adding bits of scales here and there until I was satisfied with it. Um, Let's see what your triceratops look after this point in time. I'm, I'm excited. I'm genuinely excited. Let's see. All right, Jacqueline, let's see yours. Up, up, up. Oh, they look perfect. I love it. All right. Uh, next on my screen is Carla. Oh, that's a handsome looking fella right there. I see Chris. Good job. Ceratopsian. Excellent. Everyone else, I bet your triceratopses look just as brilliant. And uh, let me show you how I would go ahead and finish this thing off. I, it's like a cooking show where they like put the thing in the oven and they bring out like a whole finished cake or something. I went ahead in my own free time and I went and made a Triceratops, you know, from scratch. And this is what I painted it like. Gave it some uh, ornamentation on the frill area, gave it some, you know, splotches of yellow coloration made it look a little interesting on parts of the body to, as a signaling point. He, like the horns don't mess with me, you know, big yellow tips. You can see these. <laughs> and then I gave it a little prehistoric bird behind it because in modern animals today, like hippos and elephants and things, there's like little birds following them, plucking out the uh, parasites from their skin. Um, I gotta thank my friend Andy for giving me this brush that he found somewhere, this paintbrush, this watercolor looking paint. Um, so this is how I would color a Triceratops. Again, a bit of a muted sort of color, but still with some patterning and some bits of flair on the face. But uh, we don't know what color Triceratopses were. Uh, the biggest thing to dictate color in a living, or really any organism, living or dead, is it's, again, it's ecology. Ecology is one of the biggest uh, factors behind all of these different features on an animal. So for something like Triceratops, which was prey, which, you know, probably didn't want to broadcast itself too hard to anything in its environment besides other triceratops. Maybe more muted color, 
palettes something more earthy. It's also less energetically expensive to make more earthy tones. But um, if you give it like brilliance red on the on the frill, that could be a thing. Brilliance blues, um, yellows, things like that. Um, so if you do feel inclined to color in your triceratops, that'd be very cool to see what you come up with based on, you know, what you think about its ecology. Is it more of a offensive headbutting or we're going to go tussle it out? Is it more of a subdued animal that only fights when provoked? Um, what's your interpretation of it? Uh, we won't know, we won't ever know what triceratops' colors are until we find um, a well-preserved specimen with color bits preserved. And that's a thing that happens in the fossil record, actually. There, there are uh, dinosaurs and other prehistoric things found with the remnants of color-producing molecules. And from that, we could infer what colors they might have been. But for triceratops, we don't know yet. Get out there and find us more triceratops if you want to be a paleontologist someday. If there's any paleontologists in chat, get out there. Find me a good triceratops. <laughs> um, and yes, so finish off your trikes. And uh, that's what we have for today, I think. Uh, open to questions. Yes, definitely feel free to put your questions in the chat. We do have some time to answer questions, whether it's about this Triceratops or, or maybe the T-Rex we did last year. Um, just gonna plug, again, the museum is open until 4 p.m. today. Uh, feel free to reserve online or just walk in. We do have walk-in spots available. Um, we'd also love to see your drawings. So if you post your um, Triceratops on Instagram or Facebook, feel free to tag the museum, PG Museum, or tag and tag Charles at the Paint Paddock. And I put everything in the chat, but I'll, I'll put them in one more time. Um, so we'll just stick around for questions. I'm gonna uh, turn off the recording and we'll, we'll stick around for a little bit.